We knew Winston from back in the acid bleat days. He was part of the uh, Forge Master Sheffield phenomenon. He's what would be known as a Sheffield DJ legend. My baptism into music was just a natural progression um, through my um, Jamaican heritage and you know the emerging pop culture that came along during the 60s and 70s in the UK. The thing with soul music for me is it just gets to your roots, doesn't it? You know, before you know it, you're captivated. You want to say something, do something, see something, feel something more. It's 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 a it's a fulfilling type of music. So it's 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 uplifting, it's energizing, it's empowering. I grew up listening to a lot of reggae music, you know, through ska, blue beat, um, rock steady, all the styles you can imagine from the 50s right through. But the, those musics initially. I actually had an aversion to because it was my parents' music. So um, I obviously, you know, without realising it, I didn't want anything to do with my parents' music. It set me off on a bit of a, a tangent towards discovering new forms of music that I hadn't experienced or hadn't been exposed to. <laughs> my excitement was for new forms of soul music, embracing new instrumentation, universal uplifting spiritual lyrics and not necessarily like love lyrics but you know empowering lyrics in hindsight i think i probably felt quite isolated in the way that i i was as a as a young person amongst even within my peer group of what i call the black ring of security which was my black friends around me who would continually pull me back into this sensibility that i, I was supposed to fit into which was like, you know, this kind of black soul sound and you do this and you go to there and you hang out with these people and you dress in this particular way. I never really had that um, connection in any way, shape or form. And although I would go along with that, I was still on my own journey. I think some of my earliest memories in terms of DJing came from in Sheffield in the early 80s a place called Maximilian's in Sheffield, which was run by a guy called Max O'Mara. Uh, and he was the first black club owner in Sheffield. And he gave me my first commercial paid job, I think, really. And, and to Max, I'm, 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 I'm eternally grateful because he allowed me the opportunity to be able to play my beloved soul music. My belief was that if you're going to be, end up playing music to people, you have to play what they wanted. And I found myself in this position where I've got a blank canvas all of a sudden. People were asking me to come and play at small scale events, to come and play what, what became termed Winston style. We would go to these venues on a, on a Sunday afternoon and it would be a 12 hour dance extravaganza. And they would have their posse with them and you and, you and your crew would represent your DJ. There were incredible posses of people and it was very tribalistic, but Sheffield didn't really have like a focus in terms of like, what DJ represented them. But when we were back in Sheffield, I was that DJ that those people would come to listen to, to come and have a dance. I, I can't even express how massively important the old Dea circuit was in terms of where youth culture and, you know, for want of a much better term, rave culture or, or, or club culture is, is now. It set the precedent, it, ta it taught people about um, unity on the dance floor. And, um, you know, that was really empowering, I think, for, for um, marginalized groups of black youth in the country and those who followed black music at the time. And um, it was completely um, inclusive. This kind of paved the way, I think, for multicultural clubbing in its kind of best form, really, where with, without, without any kind of prejudices. It, it, in that environment, you were, you were totally free. Outside of that, it was a battlefield because people that existed um, like cross-culturally within the old Aldea circuit, for example, the jazz funk scene, sometimes wouldn't dare be seen together 
black and white outside of that walking down their high street together for example they would only come together for those events so you know unbeknownst to us we were kind of setting an, um, a precedent for the way things um, would be in the future the process during that time was undocumented and absolutely intense you're talking you know like events where you've got um, you know maybe three four five hundred um, black men, uh, uh, boys and girls, all dancing and dressing in similar ways. It was very tribal, you know, very powerful, really empowering as a young black person, being able to see and go to places like, like this where you're the majority and everyone's really, really happy. It was massive. It was, it was a massive experience. Now, at the same time, there was an event in Sheffield called Jive Turkey, and it, and it started at a place called Mona Lisa's in Sheffield. Yeah. It's different. It's a pilgrimage. I've heard that it's the best thing ever, out ever, in the entire world. Max O'Mara, who ran that club, um, allowed my friend Parrot, John Batten, and, um, and Matthew Swift to run an event there called Jive Turkey. My friend, and our friend D DJ Parrot, when he played, I, I would hit the dance floor uh, and people had never seen anybody dance like that before. Um, and, it, and it just set off this chain reaction of how people felt like they could express themselves in this environment that they've been going to for all this time, uh, but not really been dancing. I'm Winston and I DJ for the Jive Turkey event. I play most of the house, funk, hip hop and soul. People actually referenced it as being the, own, the most multicultural event in the country at the time. Also, what we didn't realise was the importance of being able to go to a venue with um, different cultures of people and, and not be stopped because you weren't of a certain look, type or, 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 or way of dressing. It, it, was a, it was a new thing in Sheffield for definite. And, and um, that, the word got round for that really, really quickly. So it became a mecca for jazz heads, soul funk heads, people into electro, people into early house. And they used to come from all over the country. I think that's the first time we actually acknowledged what, what we had in our hands in terms of um, autonomy through music. It's like where you can get together with people from different towns from all over the north. You got Leeds, Bradford, Sheffield, Manchester. Bristol. Worcester. Right. The ones that kind of stand the test of times are the ones that recognise where those influences came from and try to bring that with the new music. Kings of Tomorrow, I think, was a classic example a couple of years ago of um, a reworking of soul music. And it's not a particular track that it's reworked, but it's soul music that's brought forward to today using modern instrumentation. It was beautifully put together. It's up and down, and I think you need to have those um, roller coaster moments when you're listening to music, because that's what mimics your experience of life, ups and downs. Uh, and, and that's what brings people together. I think that we're still trying to find our way back to the euphoria of soul based nights out. I've always been into music, I've been surrounded by great music throughout my whole life. It's kind of where I kind of got inspired and uh, made me become an MC. For me, it was, uh, it was all about expressing yourself in a specific way and having an outlet for all this frustration. Are we all so blind that we just don't want to face it? All this is there was always Andy C, DJ Hype, you know, friction back in the day was always on the lineup. And I became an MC because of the MCs that influenced me when I was growing up. And I became a producer because I wanted to, to make music to move people. Lockdown is here, but we just overcomplicate. I was about the message behind the music and something that moved me, like Immortal Technique, for example, Aesop Rock, Eminem. And this was conscious hip hop, like Tribe Quest. Uh, Tribe, Tribe was some of the best 
rappers and group to ever do it in my own opinion. that works but we the revolution we the people deserve more than this I bring through local talent on the drip hip-hop show and Sheffield's brimming with that I also run the local talent show on Sheffield Live I'm always searching for the next person who I believe is worthy of an opportunity because when I was coming up I wasn't given these opportunities. I'm not gonna sit here watching it all get worse. These sunny days have done. I've been in the game for quite some time now. Used to be uh, an MC with a couple of bands throughout the years, performing at festivals. Like to uh, dabble in all sorts of genres and just let it flow. I'm a part of a, an act called Zybots. Uh, I formed it with a friend of mine, Mark Williamson. We released an album last year, uh, which is called Wormhole. With Ill Tribe, we are planning to tour Europe when it goes back to normal. We've um, been working on an LP and that's gonna drop in, the, in this summer. It's called The Hill. There's, there's a lot of people out there with incredible talent which don't get anywhere because the, the, the scene's so oversaturated with people just doing it. You know, back in the day, if you were really, really good, you did everything to do it and you were scouted. You had the opportunity because people would come to you. And, um, and nowadays you can do it yourself. And that is, it's like a, it's, it's like a double-edged sword and it's really hard to find the really amazing people. I wrote something on a track called Reality and it's about you can fake it until you make it and it's ridiculous, right? And I wrote a tune about it. So deep in the sound is where I found it now and look, I wander around with some outcome. We're just having the fun with our plans. We're making our moves and stay grounded. And we're doing things that we're proud of. Never staying the same or we're sounding. Staying the same is just nonsense. So I'm making my ways with my conscience. Paving away with some strong stuff. Fading away from all the swallowing network. We don't have a problem trying to get work when you work hard in your trade. And when you're piecing together, your puzzle won't come from the rubble. It's not about fame, man. I just tell it all how it is. I don't wander around in your biz. I just got to get on with my shit. Pay my bills and then add my own twist and keep them all just licking their lips like, damn, I'm so sick of this kid. All of my face with all of his vids, so creative that when I slip wrists, it pours out the lyrics instead of my blood. I've got visions of making my stuff in my sleep, so when I sit down in my hub, I already know what I'm going to cook up. So we've got Strictly House and Garage with the pseudonym of um, Shag. They play twice a month. Those guys, man, are absolutely primo. <laughs> They pump out records, the records sell out, man. You're looking at UK garage, you're looking at UK house, they love it. Ben Skills, DJ Cardiac, you're looking at three hours on every other Saturday as an awesome event that you can enjoy. Music to me is one race, one colour, and one voice. My family uh, was incredibly musical. Uh, with my mum, for instance, I think it was a case of you're born, you handled an instrument, and you go. <laughs> and she, was, she had four kids and she was just like, go, go, go. You get an instrument. For me, it was piano and flute and uh, singing and everything. I didn't, I started piano lessons when I was six. And then, you know, my mum would constantly be singing around me. Music was everywhere in my life growing up and um, I think it would have been impossible <laughs> not to get involved in it. Usually I'll remember to click record on my phone <laughs> and then I just go and then usually after that I can tell is this going to be something that I'm gonna, gonna want to carry on working on and make into something polished and take to the band or whatever. Ooh, once you said you didn't Life is so hard and for me, music has been 
such an easy way to put all of those feelings in there and to just reach out to other people who might be feeling that way too. The thing that I think about music is it's an opportunity to take all the things that are going on in your head, all the pain, all the, all the stresses of life, and you put it into something physical that can then express to other people, this is a thing, you're not alone. You know, music does that. I'm really obsessed with Enna. All of his songs are completely just so raw and vulnerable and painful to listen to. And, and the stories he tells about his life and about what he's going through just really strike a chord like with me. I, I, I think his music is incredible. I've got one that's like called Big Vocals. And usually I whack that one in the shower or in the bath. And I'll just like, that's got like Beyonce, Christina Aguilera, all the big, like Whitney Houston, Aretha Franklin. And then I've got other ones that are just a bit more, um, you know, your indie, kind of more comfy, chill, kind of like Phoebe, Br Phoebe Bridges, uh, Billie Eilish, Conan Gray. It just depends on the mood, really, mate. I listen to all songs. Two different songs that I think I uh, would say are my favourite to play. Um, the first being the fun one, <laughs> uh, which is a song called You Instead. I missed my chance, you slipped through my hands. Yeah, and it's got quite an upbeat, fast tempo, and it's just really fun. Probably the more important one um, for me is a song of mine called Stay. I, I lost my best friend. Um, she took her own life uh, three years ago. And um, I wrote this song as a way to be able to say what I wanted to say to her, um, what I felt needed to be said, and, um, and try and say that to as many people as possible. You don't want to miss everything around you, the simple bliss of the things that people do, a hot cup of tea in the rain, the squeeze of a lover's hand, the sound of children laughing in your feet, Buried in the sun. It's my favourite verse of it. And when it comes to music, there is no segregation, no nation. I'm an MC, rapper, percussionist, musician. I'm a music producer and guitar player and percussionist. My kind of music I would describe as a fusion of my love for African music. My music is based on a combination of a lot of things. Afro-futuristic, Afro-fusion. Ever since I was a little kid, I just knew I wanted to play music. It was largely my parents' influence of um, my dad's record collection. And my mum played the violin and sung, so I quickly was doing violin lessons, and then I begged her for a guitar. And from that point onwards, it's just been music all the way. I'm Jamaican, and I feel like you just naturally sort of just like, um, influenced by music, it's around you 24-7, can't escape it and I listen to a lot of reggae and then coming to UK and listening to crazy enough a lot of pop music but then just um, falling in love with hip-hop as soon as I heard it, that's, those were the things that like sort of made me sort of love music. I never really thought about being a rapper, I just thought that's something you're born with. You know, mixing and blending different cultures, different styles of instruments, different ways of playing instruments into my own kind of sound and create this sound that music is not just for one person or for one culture, it's, it's a combination of cultures. Coming to England kind of also enhanced that taste because of jazz and drum and bass, dubstep, because it all kind of has that African influence and has the African sound. Some pillars of inspiration for me, Osborne Ruddock, King Tubby, Nitin Sawney. I was influenced by Sizzla Kalonji, Bob Marley, a bit of Michael Jackson here and there, some gospel music. Bojo, Capleton, Barry Salmon, some of the older generation that my parents used to listen to. And then um, anyone, anything that was fresh and new at the time, it was just part of the culture to be on the forefront of that and experiencing that. We had a tour, a small tour of Africa last year, Tanzania and Zanzibar. That was the last gig we did before lockdown, so we're really, really hoping we can get 
back out and play some music. Before the lockdown, I was basically touring. We're, we're on a massive tour around Europe with KOG and the Zunga Brigade. I was like sort of just on the verge of my solo tour with my live band. But yeah, obviously, COVID come and do it thing. At the moment, I'm working on my own solo album because it's COVID, but I play in different kind of projects. I play in Onipa, which is like an Afro-futuristic outfit, five of us, and then the Zongo Brigade with my brother Franz Vaughn. At the moment, my music is a hip-hop solo album. The thought themes for it is um, empowerment of people. Just the way things are at the moment and the way people are feeling disempowered really and feeling, I feel like there's a lot of hopelessness going on and I think it's sort of uh, reflecting the music. Recently I've been working on Onipa's next record which is going to be a kind of mixtape of lots of different flavours and styles off the back of our last album called We Know Be Machine. Talking about the influence of technology you know on, on human life and we, we talked about how there's less connection between humans and about how we can build autonomous communities and celebrate how music brings people together. The next track release is actually going to be called Power Be You, more of a toned down hip hop. It's hype in a, in a different sense, but it's also a little bit of um, touching on political themes and just the situation that people are finding themselves in now, like the oppression that's going on, the racism, just basically reflecting the mood that's here now and give out some sort of energy of empowerment. Like people have got power between us. We've got power, we've also got power, so yeah. I think the 80s and the 90s music has got that long lasting effect on our memories because most people were themselves as well at that time. There wasn't stuff like social media, you know, and that, that humanistic connection that we had in the 80s. The music has grown and grown and grown and today, like you can hear some, some sounds, people are bringing back the 80s and 90s sounds. I think there's a, there's a rawness to music from, you know, the 70s to the 90s where it's just musicality and connection and the content seems a bit more true and it can stand the test of time. Now there seems to be so many ways to sort of get out there or it also depends on what you want, what you want, where do you want to take the music but there's so many paths to it so I feel like social media has made it easier in one way but really sort of um, confusing and sort of like a maze to sort of find a way through. The creation of the music, there was a lot of soul in it. Now the music is sort of filtered out because almost anyone can release some music. Being in a city like London or Sheffield with this amazing cultural togetherness is so exciting as an artist because you get to learn of other people and I feel that in music you can celebrate the individual for their talent and they can solo on an instrument and you have this unique individual personality but at the same time when they all come together in a band they're, they're bigger than the sum of their parts and I feel like that's a metaphor for life that if we come together as communities and cultures and learn off each other we're going to be stronger as one. What is real or what is real is just inferior, familiar faces, grace with smiles on exterior but the hain in the heart, bad interior, serious, bad intention, the motive also ulterior. Yo, the motion infinite, perpetual, rep it blessed with phoneticals, messages through electrical. Read it, the rhyme's legible, feel it, the vibe's incredible. Energy rise ineffable, ready, raise up the decibel. This is my music. She's somebody who has been on the scene for 30, 40 odd years. She lays down some crazy beats, some serious, heavy techno dub jungle. Yet she looks like the sort of lady, until she speaks of course, that would make you like an apple pie. I've been DJing for well, since the early 90s, I was in my late 30s by the time I started DJ. There's so many good tunes out there, so many different styles as well. And I didn't think that was being catered for on the radio. And I just decided I would do it myself. I was the only woman on the station. In fact, I was the only woman DJing, I think, at that time. 
got into ska when I was a teenager and then moved from that to reggae and dub. I love my drum and bass, of course. I do like techno, I like break beats as well. Anything in between, I'm, I'm up for anything really. I started doing a show on fantasy. Did that for about a year. And then one night I was uh, at a party about four in the morning, sat outside just chilling, chatting to a guy. And all of a sudden he said to me, you're that woman off Fantasy FM. I'm putting on a gig and I want to book you. So I suddenly went from being in a studio with just the studio engineer to standing in a club in front of 500 people. Well, the first booking I got was with Jamie Headcharge, and we started putting these nights on. Over the years, well, it didn't take all that long, actually. We'd, we'd get a thousand people in every gig, and that run for around 10 years or something. But we had people like Apex Twin, The Orb, loads of people playing there. Straight away, I was getting booked to play out in, well, all over the UK, really. And then I started getting booked abroad as well. I've played in Berlin quite a few times, and I've played in Mexico. A lot of places in Europe, Australia, played in Australia. I hardly ever ran into any female DJs to the point where I used to get asked by lots of young women in clubs, how can I get into it and how can I try it? So I started tutoring young women. I was working with 15, 16 year olds mainly. I never really stopped because if I've got some tunes, I have to share them. Music always changes. Music just changes and evolves. And now the kids have got the facility to, they can take any kind of thing from any era and mix it into something new. Music is one race. One colour. One voice. Musician, vocalist, songwriter, rapper, jack of all trades, yeah. master of none. But we're working on it, you know? <laughs> RMD. I've been doing it since I was young. I've always liked music and liked melodies. It was just growing up around musical friends and just being inspired by hearing good music. Fuji's were a big inspiration, Tupac, and a lot of other hip hop influences. Although I listened to things such as UB40 and Simply Red growing up. All them things individually and collectively inspired me. I always kind of start with a hook because that's like the foundation of what the concept of the song is going to be. But I produce as well, so it mainly starts with a melody that I create and then I'll go on to the hook and then I'll follow it up with bars that relate to the hook as much as I can as well. I met Leona at a housewarming party and then I saw her there playing guitar. The timing was just perfect so I was just like we should do stuff together. The busking probably didn't come until maybe a year after that. At first it was actually pretty hard because I, I felt like I, a lot of people knew me in Sheffield and stuff and then there's the side where people have their set opinions on what, how, what busking is and stuff so you know pride was, a, was hang, lurking around there after getting over that pride thing. It was just an enjoyable time, day after day. No, no. The old school way of getting your music out there and word of mouth, I've always rated that. But these days, with the internet, it kind of does take away a little bit, but at the same time, I think it really helps getting it out to the masses. You and I don't want you to lose. I would say Nas, to be honest. I've always thought that he's grounded and he likes to talk on history of things and I feel like history can sometimes be forgotten. Deep, not very subtle, he's bleeding. I used to go to Niche, I used to go to Zero, Westways, Static, Takapuna, Banus, all them places there. My man, another way, I'm no. <laughs>
It starts off as giving everyone a kind of positive message that's a younger, that's, you know, kind of misguided by all the dreadness that we see on TV and listen to on radio and this and that. So it started as that, but I've got a son myself, he's 13, and I know that times can be real serious for people and kids that have had no guidance. So I, it was kind of a thing where I wanted to talk some guidance into him. That's how that rhythm kind of come around. When I was listening to that song, I think it also kind of reaches that the youths from kind of like where we're from. You know what I mean? It's like a lot of pressure sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. You know what I mean? If you're in a certain crowd, if you're part of a certain culturistic group, or you yeah. go to a certain school and you're on a certain area, you're not up to be your G. Mm. You know what I mean? We, it took us a lot of growing. Yeah, you know what for I mean? real. You don't have to be a G. No, oh, oh, there's nothing that you need to prove. I know you see him shining, but I see you as a diamond, they ain't ever gonna shine like you. I like to give thanks for the fact that I'm still alive. It's a shame some of them still only see him black and white. If they looked a little deeper than the colour of their skin, I think they'd actually be surprised. Please don't get it confused, I still got nothing to prove. Just live in an open mind, they got us trapped in a zoo. Politics, the economy, everything in between has had us segregated from being human beings. You're saying it's for the flag and you want God to save the queen. You treat your missus like a bet you'll be sorry when she leaves. Either your way or the highway, that's how you end up alone. And by the looks of it, that's how it's going to be. But it's not the way it's got to be. It's never set in stone. Part of being a minority is standing on your own, being proud of who you are. Because who you are is who you've grown and realising we're all just blood, flesh and bones. One grace, one vision, give me your hands, give me your hearts, I'm ready! <laughs> I play lead guitar for girls school and Cyteria. I am working with different bands, the main one being Cyteria. I was 13 when the punk revolution kicked. I just wanted to write music and that was my starting point. My brother had a bass guitar, then a friend walked past the window and I thought, right, come in here, sing this song so I can see if it works. And after that, it became default. I was, all of a sudden I was the guitar player. And after two weeks, we did a gig. I knew one chord and we just went for it. Punk rock days, and that's how I got into music. I've always been involved in music since I'm a really young person. Uh, because my parents are musicians as well. Uh, I had my first band when I was 13 and we would do like rock and roll covers and play in, in the local scene. We got on like a house on fire, all the rest of the band were there and Kelly was the guitarist at the time, she didn't want to carry on. So she said, you need to play, you need to learn how to play lead guitar and you can join girls school. And eventually, Chris Bonacci, who was the guitarist at the time, and she said to me, if I teach you the songs, you go in and practice them, you'll be ready. I went every day to her house, she was showing me the songs, I was learning them, and then I went away, practiced bent strings until my fingers were bleeding here. It was, I've never done that in my life before then. And they said, okay, we're ready for a gig. And um, they booked three gigs, and the first one was Wacken. And I went, no, <laughs> I am not doing that as my first gig. So I, I said, Kelly, you do this as your last one, and I promise I'll take over. Me and Kim and Denise have been together ever since then, so 22 years now. With Jackie, it was just natural. We just hit the ground running. Well, Satyria is an original project, so it was initially just bedroom sessions, working on the, some demos of original songs that she already had written. So the first album is mostly songs that Jackie had already pre-written. <laughs> If I had to pick one artist to collaborate with, I'd have to say Alex Cooper. Because when, when I write songs, I kind of write with him in mind sometimes, because I grew up on Alex Cooper. He was my first like rock hero, as it were. I mean, the song I wrote for Cyteria called Halloween, when I was writing it, I was thinking Alex Cooper all the way through. The baby says she's traveling on the one after 9.09. Just, it has, it has groove, it has, you know, this thing that makes your feet each and you just want to move. That's one of the reasons that I want to be on stage, to get people, you know, tapping their feet and moving around and just transmit the positivity and the energy of music. Streams, streams. 
the moment in my CD player, I have um, Hollywood Vampires, which again is Alice Cooper in it, Johnny Depp. But I'm also listening to a lot of Wild Hearts, Terrorvision from back in the day, a bit of Rammstein. I have a, quite a wide spectrum of music. I mean, if I'm exercising, I'll put something pop on. I have all sorts of music, international music, and also music back from Argentina, like Queen or The Beatles, Black Sabbath. I just also really love Latin music. It's not just rock music. I, I'm massively influenced growing up by Bossa Nova and by other styles from Latin America. I think my favorite song of Siteria would be Halloween. I could see the audience singing along because they've learned it and it's just like, scream, scream, it's Halloween. Take out all the blondes and behead the prom queen. That's the backing harmony. I don't know what the lead is. It's so wonderful to be on stage and, and give that much energy out and because what you get back in return is massive as well. I just want people to, to hear the music and kind of see and listen to the music. I, I, me, I, it, me, it's just me, it doesn't matter, you know, my image. It's, it's more about that the music comes across. Girls' School have already started booking. We've got a tour booked in the UK at the end of this year in November. We're just hoping it's going to come off. We've been focusing mainly on writing music and uh, kind of the music videos, so doing things, you know, remotely. I'll be here till I'm 60. I'll be here until I'm, I can't do it anymore, I think. So I'm hoping for the more of the same. We've just done a video which should be released. We Citeria this is. We've just done a video which should be released this month. And Girls School, uh, right now, we're writing a new album which will be released next year. I want to play bigger and bigger shows, but also have the, the ability to play intimate shows. Basically, I want to continue doing what I'm doing in two years, and 10, and 20, and for however long I live, I just want to play music and put positivity out in the world. The old bands, we just rely on gigs, merchandise, and things like that. So I think the industry has changed it a lot, but it's for the better in a lot of ways, because new people who would have never got the chance of being in front of a huge audience, they can now get on YouTube and anybody can be a rock star. Especially in this time of pandemic for musicians, is so massive to be able to have platforms to share their music and get people to support them. Artists can now just promote directly to, to the, the audiences. But yeah, the internet's changed it a lot. Sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse, I think, yeah. Because you can't now bring back the 80s. That, that sort of rock style, lifestyle is kind of gone. I am here in my studio, The Steelworks, in Sheffield. I've been here for a long time, it feels like. We're pushing 26, 27 years. These are the songs from a yacht named Sue, a little bit more intimate, a little bit more acoustic, but uh, I hope you like it. And the start of this is a song called Fragile. Won't you let it out? On secrets you've been keeping. I can't actually remember not having music in my life. The first album I ever bought in Australia and saved up for was a, a Belgian techno band called Telex. I just couldn't believe the sounds that I was hearing, and it turned out to be synthesizers. That path eventually led me to uh, soul music, and once I discovered Motown and um, Philly, that just started influencing me. So, so you know, over here, we sort of had blue-eyed soul bands, you know, which Johnny Hates Jazz or, you know, uh, Curiosity Killed the Cat. I just couldn't get enough of what felt like real music to me. That's sort of become my thing nowadays, that everything I do has sort of got a soulful touch to it. Once that started, it was just, there was just too much beautiful music to absorb. My philosophy nowadays is, if you, if you have the ability and you have the talent to do this, what you're actually given is the ability to serve music. I always say I just happen to be 
lucky enough to be holding a pencil the day the universe wants to write a song. Anyone who's succeeded doing this for as long as I have, you realize there are certain times in your life you make a serious sacrifice. But in that time, in those windows of years, you do your time. You know, you do it because you can't not do it. You turn up and you learn and absorb as much as you can. I went to a meeting with the guy, he played me a record of a girl. I wasn't that buzzed about it. So who else do you manage? Oh, I've got something, it's not really ready yet, it's a bit early. I said, what is it? And he went, well, it's just these five girls. It's like a pop R&B thing. So well, that sounds fun. Let me work with them. Two of them turned up the night before and said, we're firing our manager tomorrow because he wouldn't give us your phone number. And that was Mel B and Jerry from the Spice Girls. And the next day we met Victoria and Emma at the bus station, that tells you everything. Mel C came over from Liverpool and we came into this room and started a relationship that changed our lives. It, they went on and literally changed the world. That was, that was the beginning of all of it. Thankfully for me, one thing would lead to another and all of a sudden you've got, you have a number one record. I, I, I had an ambition to have a number one by the time I was 25. If I could have a number one when I was 25, I've got something to tell the grandkids and the, and, and the kids. Everything changes by take that went to number one on my 25th birthday. And it was like, okay, I'm not in charge of this. I'm clearly in a flow of energy and I'm just gonna surrender to it and see where it takes me. And it did. My attitude towards this is that, that, that music is a part of that energy that flows through everything in the universe. The energy is all creative. It's all pervasive. It only knows how to create. And we get to personalize it somehow. We get that, uh, the ability. But the key to it is this, it's not ours, it doesn't belong to, it's all we get to do is serve it. My relationship with Gary goes, I mean, it started with everything changes and we just connected on that day. We were working together. So all of a sudden we were having hits together and we keep meeting up in unusual places. I'd be in America, be in LA, we'd be in New York, he'd be there, we'd get together. Anytime anything happens, I remember being in LA once and getting a phone call to see if I wanted to go and work with Burt Bacharach, who's my idol of all songwriters. And the first person I called was Gaz. And he said, Hell, have you got anything? Meaning, have you got any ideas? You know, I went, no. He went, pull over and get some of it, you know. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, I better do, I better not go in dry. I got there and Burt Bacharach opened the door, beautiful man, lovely, nice, gentle, welcoming dude. We write a song and Luther Vandross sings it. It's, it's a crazy, crazy experience. But that relationship with Gary has always been an anchor. We send each other ideas. It's just a, one of those once in a lifetime writing relationships that you have to treasure. That, you know, I, I've been lucky to have experienced that with Gary and it, and it continues. X Factor was an interesting one. I, was, I did it because Gary was doing it. I didn't really, un, really get, get the concept and I've never really wanted to write for any of those artists but I did understand why a band had never, never won and I told the producers why and they went right we want you to do this so I did it and my band was uh, was Little Mix they listened to me and did it and worked it and they won because they're brilliant and I'm so proud of them as an adult and as someone who's been doing this a long time you want to try and impart that wisdom as often as possible. If you can pass on a strong work ethic and give them some tips along the way, which then, you know, these are gonna be the potholes. I'm not saying avoid them because falling in them is just as important. Avoid them where possible, but not avoid the experience. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, success should be measured like this. If one person breathes easier because you're alive, then you've succeeded. I love choirs. The, vo the human voice arranged with other voices stops me in my tracks. It's something about that that kills me. So, but then I like to listen to Slipknot sometimes. For me, it's a, all about just filling your soul full of music. No better place in the this was a movie about the day Bobby Kennedy was killed. He was the last, right for the, the last hope for the civil rights movement because his brother JFK and then Dr. King both taken. He was going to help. Uh, the civil rights movement like no other president. And then all of a sudden, Saran Saran turns up in the kitchen of that restaurant and kills him. And um, that's what the movie is about, about the day in the hotel. I remember when we were asked to write it, we were asked who lost the most. And it was very clear to me that African-Americans lost the most. 
he was he was going to change stuff and then his, his life is taken and that country goes back decades and we're still dealing with it you know racism I, it bewilders me i've never witnessed it in this room because we're musicians anyone who comes in here we're all the same right somehow music takes you beyond all that but you step outside into the real world and it just it bewilders me in a country like america where black culture has had such an influence on its only real authentic art which was jazz and soul and blues yet they're still dealing with the fact that they've got the same color skin it's mental to me and then we write this song because it was about that subject and lo and behold aretha franklin read my lyric and said i have to sing this song because it's the best lyric i've read in 20 years the one voice that i've would have ever you know desired to be a part of that career sings one of my songs and we get nominated for a golden globe and we win a grammy with it and then the lady dies which is tragic we've lost that incredible light black lives matter take on that song as a theme come on these are these moments in your life where you just have to hold your hands up and feel absolute pleasure and fortunate to be a part of them Gary called me and said, El, you need to make an album. You know, he said, you're a singer. You've, you've got a fan base. People know who you are. You know, it's not like you started from scratch. I just thought he was nuts. And he ignored it, you know. He arranged for me to meet a producer, a, 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 sh a, a promoter. You know, he says, El, what else are you doing? It's COVID's happened. Get on with making a record. So I've got no excuse. So I just decided, you know what, I'll do it for fun and see where it goes from there. But it's fantastic fun. and. I'm, I've made an album full of the music I grew up on, which is sort of yacht, rock, pop, late 70s, early 80s, blue-eyed soul, if you like. MCLL and Chris, DJ Stav, are again absolute legends on the on the Sheffield DJ scene. They were part of probably one of the, the, the most big times for Sheffield Super Clubs. So they were part of something called MY Sushi. Been involved in the scene in Sheffield from the mid 90s, early 90s? Yeah, 96, 96. I started, I think. London Road, Music Factory. Yeah, which then later progressed to be NY Sushi. Yeah. They came at a different angle where it wasn't pure drum and bass. I think it? what it was, was it always had that edge to it as a rave scene. I mean, it's always had a, a rich musical heritage, without a doubt. I, I think it was just a, yeah, a brilliant time for it to happen. The film Beat Street, watching the guy doing his own mixing in the bedroom, and, it, and, and just the music, because I was, I was a big fan of hip hop then. And Africa Man Batter, Melly Mel, and they was all in this film, and this film was just, just perfect because this is what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a DJ. I just wanted to talk down the mic. I don't know what it was. I wanted to hear what it sounded like. I'd seen it on TV and stuff, and then got into rave music, and it was like Top Buzz, uh, and hearing like MC Spider and Bass and stuff like that, and just hearing the, the sound of, of these guys controlling the whole crowd and just watching the reaction was just amazing. <laughs> Obviously it is about the music as well, but it's being a hype man, it's being a person that can entertain a crowd. You have got to work with a DJ, it goes without a doubt, but you've got to be like the, the, the little tool that's in between the crossfader and the speakers and help him work and then he'll help me work and it comes together. I think there was three or four of us, local residents, and it'd be who could get the first white label. And if you could get that first, play it out first, then you would be all right. You know, social media was around, obviously, 10, 50 years ago, but not as popular as what it is today, and how artists use it to promote themselves, which is totally different, isn't it? It's completely so, different concept now. I know, it's just, it's just it's a just, different way of yeah, doing of it, isn't it? And it's like, yeah. doing, doing this, I mean, Stav invited me down, and he's got this show going, and it's, you know, broadcasting worldwide, so he's See, keeping we're, we're, we're both advice. been out the scene for a fair few years, haven't we, really? It, you know, we were bigger than the 90s, going into the 2000s. We're not going to be superstar DJs now, we know that, but we love music. 
Yeah, it's a passion. It's, it's, the passion it's, like we come down here, don't we? We, we love it. We get on there yeah, and have a little two again. hours of, of just getting engrossed in the music and just, if you're, if you're passionate about music, if you love music, music it never leaves you. It's, it's always in you. It gives you memories. It, it just, it's there for every age and every genre. Isn't it? We've, uh, we've created a, like a show called the Friday Night Social on Gumbo FM and we're trying to get the new talent and we're getting them in to do like a feature show. One hour slot with us both. For us to see these new talent and new artists coming through and, and doing their own thing, is, is like, I don't know, it feels good, doesn't it? It's humbling, it's really, and, yeah. and it's a good feeling, really good feeling. As much as it's easier because you're taking less to the to the gigs, mm -hmm. you've got to now think on a completely different format. I, I don't even know what we're doing, but we'll put us on there, on there of how you can chop and change and drop it's, samples it and it, mix it. Don't it, you think it, it has elevated now. it to a different it's level? It's completely elevated because you could create a sound in a sound. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you could make that record a completely different record. As an MC, when I started to perform, yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd write all these lyrics out at home and, and do all this stuff. But then you get to a rave and you, you can't sort of write, do it as you've written it, so to speak. It's got to be worked with the crowd and see how the crowd's it's working crowd's or what the DJ's playing. Nobody wants to be average. You've got to try and perform and, and work the crowd and get everybody in there. There's always that question, is it an overpowering MC or a good MC? The MC, in my eyes, was there to like you fill in the gaps, mm. and you did it, that's what you were perfect. In. <laughs> You're never too old to rave. <laughs> Fight. We'll see about that next week, boys. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm doing, you're not grasping. Lyrically, I'm everlasting. Other MCs out there, I'm blasting. Out the way now without asking. I'm taking over. I'm a few years older. You roll like a pebble, watch me roll like a boulder. Top lyrical spitter, never a quitter. Right now, crew, it's time to give the introduction inside the function. I get down with the beat and drum and yo, I'll be the E-double. You're in my lyrical bubble. With me and there will be trouble. Listen now when I bring in my hustle. And it's like that. The best way to describe it is a small, lovely, beautiful lady with a ginormous voice and an amazingly large double bass. Strangely enough, she lives at the end of my garden. No, she's not a gnome, but she actually lives in a house that's directly kind of square opposite to my house. I would describe myself as a singer, songwriter, instrumentalist, or a musician. I started off classically, and I started off on the cello. And then in my 20s, I started playing a bit of bass guitar and a bit of guitar. And then I kind of like got more into the double bass, more into the swing sort of side of things and into jazz and everything. I've got 10 of my own CDs that I've written. They are more jazz ones, the first seven or eight ones, which I'd say a very 70s kind of sounding. Nice. The 70s was quite formative for me. I was in my early teens and I think it was more the sort of funk that was coming out of the 70s. And in the 80s, I started discovering that more like Stevie Wonder, like Shaka Khan, like Earth, Wind and Fire, those sort of sounds. And then the jazz sort of side of it, I started hearing Ron Carter and Ray Brown and people like that. It was like a bit old school. It was a bit Miles Davis, kind of blue, those sort of albums. But then there was the singers like Anita O'Day. There were certain musicians like Bill Evans. There is so much music in there and so much swing that is quite phenomenal. Now, what I'm like combining is that sort of soulful, funky sound with the jazzy sort of sound. And then the classical's coming in because I'm putting a lot of strings now on the music that I write. I didn't really hit the rave sort of thing much. I was getting older then and getting like family starting to hit. But then again, like my daughters are like really into grime now and, and rap and that, I can feel all those influences. Having come from a very strict classical background, I think all genres of music are valid and they all have something to say. And I think the more they get mixed up, the better. And I think that's something that that mixing melting pot is definitely becoming more so. And I love it. I think before it was like albums, tapes, CDs that you'd try and sell them through shops and on gigs and things. Certainly the last few years with social media and streaming. In some ways it's given control 
to individuals away from big conglomerates. But in other ways, it's getting harder and harder for actual musicians to make any money at all. I think we just always refer back. So we're always referring back to what our parents were listening to, whether we subconsciously or consciously know that. I think today, everything goes on the shoulders of the decades before. So even still, the sounds of the 80s and 90s were fresh and new. We're still going back to the 70s and the 60s and the 50s and 40s. You can't deny what, where all that music came from before that even. I went through uh, my computer and looked at old songs that I'd written and not finished, and I've got loads. So I decided to do an EP, which I released a couple of months ago, and I've got another one that will be in the making. One project that's been fantastic and has involved uh, musicians, DJs, singers, songwriters from Sheffield, which was an idea by Brian Day, who's a guitarist, and he, just, he suggested, why don't we start off this project that's like the game Pass It On, or that paper folding down consequences game. So we all got an idea, like on, on a WAV, emailed it to the next person on. And now we're getting our songs back with 19 different tracks on. And it's an amazing venture, because like I say, it's got DJs in it. The, some of the mixes are, are phenomenal, really. This is called Lesson to Learn. She said, you are beloved. Told him he was love. Told him he was everything she'd always dreamed of. And then she's up and left him, never to return. What a lesson that boy had to learn. And there's no segregation in our nation when it comes to music. There was a street party. There's this lad, skinny as can be. He was there in amongst a load of wires, in amongst a massive, massive sound system. Way, way bigger than what was needed. We got down to the mutual liking of music. Where can we take this? What can we do that's local, that helps charity, that hits that little sweet spot of doing some music for a reason? This felt, this radio station concept yeah, man, bring it on. We can, we can be more than just some guys liking music because people appear to be coming to us. The main ethos of Gumbo FM is a kind of charitable journey, helping Sheffield and everything in Sheffield to increase and improve via the power of music. The reason for the name Gumbo FM, Gumbo being that sort of gumbo stew and that kind of sharing coming together where you've got lots of little bits that lots of different people have got, but you haven't got anything yourself. But if you all come together as a community, you can make something special, make that special musical stew. And that's what this is. Gumbo FM brings people together. I believe in every fibre that music is one race. One colour. One voice. This is where the magic goes down. This is where you find the real element of what makes Kazai Jones sound unique. Rhythmic, funk, blues, afro and jazz. That's what you have, that's what I create. Sometimes I'm here for days on end concocting sounds and elements of funk for you to enjoy. It's from a, a song called Cash from my first album. I started in a very unorthodox way, as in I was uh, basically schooling in the UK and I left school at a very young age. I came to London and uh, I met a whole load of musicians who were basically at that time what they called busking which is there's a whole circuit of people who move around from London, Barcelona, Prague, Paris, busking, playing on the street. I started uh, writing and composing my music and busking my music on the street. As a result of that, I went to Paris for the first time, purely because I collect all these postcards in Paris, like, you know, Mark Davis went there, all the jazz greats, all the African-American writers went there. You know, Paris is a romantic city for like outcasts and artists and stuff. And I started doing the same thing, busking. And luckily, I met a guy who saw me play, and he had a label at that time called De La Belle, and I got signed to the label about a year later. But uh, that's how I entered the music industry. I was basically out of school, playing hooky from 
any responsibilities. I was just basically, you know, enjoying myself. And along the way, I met somebody who recognized what I was doing and, and, and signed me. That was a long time ago, that was 20 years ago, that's how I got signed. When I got there, I was able to basically uh, express myself in a way I, I wouldn't have been able to express myself in London. Um, it was just very liberating, and very freeing in my mind. My music writing jumped up a superior notch in the sense that I was inspired by everything around me. I noted everything down. My songwriting really, really developed at that time. My experiences I had there was amazing too. I had the whole Paris to myself. I'd busk and the city would be empty. Paris would be empty, you know, by like 10, 11 o'clock. I'd walk around and just stay inspired and write all this stuff down. Write a song, the next day I'd play it. And the more you play it, the better it got. So that was the defining moment for me. I've always tried to find a way to express um, what I consider to be uh, my deeper self in the sense that by playing music, I want to find a way to speak a language that uh, the, the, the most amount, amount of people can understand. And that's the language of rhythm. It's a rhythmic uh, way of looking at music. I played the bass line, the guitar line, and the, and the percussion line all at the same time. Because I was playing on the street, I had to accompany myself, and I had to make it sound like a bigger band. Um, so my, my whole thing is to try to express that inner part of myself that combines the African elements, uh, European sensibility, and like the otherworldliness. I called it blue funk. It was a music that gave you every aspect of things. Lyrically, it was political and emotionally intense. It was bluesy, it was funk, it was jazz, it was afro, it was rhythmic. It was everything in one place. And uh, that's where I was coming from, really, musically. All my inspirations are basically Fela, Fela, John Coltrane, Miles Davis, Thelonious Monk, Charlie Parker, you know, all the jazz guys. And of course, Fela was in there, part of the greats for me. Jimi Hendrix, in terms of guitar, Frank Zappa, you know, these are people who did unusual things with their instruments and unusual ways of composing and stuff like that and brought different elements into something. Music is all, music is everything. I mean, you could say, we had this discussion last night. Some music is noise to some people and some noise is music to some people, depending on your, on your position and how you perceive it. Uh, I think everything is music. I can sit here and listen to my generator and I can hear harmonies in the way it hums. And I can, I can look at that as musical, whereas to other people it's just noise. So music is really just based on your perception. I look at music as sound, and the world is sound, ultimately. Everything is composed of sound, which is called vibrations. So I'm into all this theory about music and the theory of sound, but um, music is everything. Music is the way we communicate with other people. It's the way you express your emotions and all these things. The reason I call my music blue funk, like I said, it's a composition of African elements and European elements. The African element is a, is a rhythm. My family, I'm Yoruba, I'm from Adokita, Igbe. That's where, like, you know, some deep Egba situation goes down rhythmically. I saw it, man, every time I came home, and I hear that the drummers, my father was a Balugo in Berlin, so I had these drummers used to come to our house, I recorded their music. I went to the place where they made the drums because they, they found out I was interested in this stuff. I hung out with my dad every time he went to the king's house. I, I heard all the chieftain seat council meetings. I saw the way they behave with each other. I read a lot of the history books as well, like Samuel, um, Samuel Johnson book about the Yorubas, uh, Amos Sutwala uh, writings, Yoruba language. So as well as having practical family uh, uh, experience, I did a lot of theoretical research behind it too. Um, so really, it is in me. Um, and I can only play the way I play. I mean, I, have no, I can't help it. I play in a rhythmical way. So I use it like a drum. I use the guitar like a drum. Um, but of course, I'm making chords at the same time. So that's what I call blue funk. And that's why I think the African element comes in very strongly in my music, the way I play the guitar. And of course, in my phrasing, the way I say my words too. When the album came out, I was signed by a French label. So when the album came out, it came out in France first before it came out everywhere else. And it became very successful in France. And I think also the French people are very attracted by live music. I'm a live musician, you know, I have to play live. And I play differently every time. Every time you come to a Kazai Jones concert, it's a transcending experience. Like, you know, I don't play the same thing the same way. I can't. So basically every concert is different. And I make uh, a real effort to, to transcend, bring everybody with me to another place at the end of the concert. So every concert has had a good reviews and good, um, uh, reactions to it um, and so the French generally speaking have reacted to my music a lot but since then I've moved to I uh, played in Germany I played in Australia I played in Japan the Japanese also re reacted to the music very strongly in America as well in Switzerland this last album I did called uh, Captain Rugged I was basically it was all about the city of Lagos and it's all about uh, this idea of a superhero who lives in the city who thinks is a superhero it's a it's a it's a graphic novel and an album I did three months of research with a guy called Native Makari, who traveled all over Lagos, uh, uh, sketching and also uh, interviewing people for this, for this project. 
Uh, the album was also written about the city of Lagos at the time. Totally the roots where I came to music, very unorthodox. A lot of touring, a lot of trekking, a lot of, you know, it's an old school way of coming to music, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of music that makes you very situated deeply in sound in music. And you do it for the love of music in the sense that I'm very happy sitting in a room all by myself, playing my guitar to myself. Um, and also, when you have to tour a lot to, to get your music to people, it gives you a different way of thinking as well. If you have to busk on the street, people are just going by. How do you make a total stranger stop? You know, there's all these things you have to think about. Today, I think there's a lot of people who come into music very quickly and just like that without doing necessarily a lot of legwork. But it's because the industry is young, and I think it's, it's young and it's very, very vibrant, it's very optimistic. Everybody's like, yeah, Yo, you know, we've got this one album or one song. But to think long term, to think 20 years, to think fella type of thinking where it's like legendary and sort of something's going to affect generations. I'm thinking long term. I want my music to be listened to long after I'm dead and gone. So I'm writing songs uh, that are aimed for when I'm no longer here sometimes. But also, um, in terms of the lyrical sensibility, what's going on right now, it's still very uh, aspirational. The, the lyrics are still very about being proud of what you have materially, which is cool, it's new. But at the same time, music is designed, is supposed to be used for upliftment and for development, psychological development, social development. Um, that's one thing that I find a little bit missing. But I think, like I said, it's still, it's still early days. When we really understand the power of music and what it can do to people, then you'll find the whole history is it's shifting. What is music? They say music is a republic. It's a kind of free form that dictates. The blues laid down the law, and then jazz disobeyed it. While rock and roll tried to muscle in, the almighty blue funk just played it. So that's what we say, play Jones, play. Claire Jane Garrett came onto our radar because she definitely, via social media, has got some kind of crazy, very noticeable posts of some very fine looking people, men and women. I'm a makeup and body paint artist. My main area of work is in the glamour and music industry. Been doing it for about 10 years. I don't believe there's genres anymore, but the way my work is that I pull in influences from everything that I was into. So I was into punk, and then I was into rave, and I was into electronica and hip hop, and every form of music. I do pull in from all of that with a particular style that I know that people are gonna be interested in. And I think a big one at the moment is album cover, mixtape artwork for a couple of Radio and Extra artists. There's quite a lot of drill and R&B and various other things, but I play to that market uh, because that's where the work is in London at the moment. I got one opening for Dimsy 6-7, I think, and then that spiralled for me working more in music industry. And that is exactly the area I wanted to be in. And I'm not inspired by one particular artist. I'm inspired by everything. And I like to keep moving forward and keep looking at what's current. So anything that I'm doing, I know that I'm playing to a specific market, but with my style. So I found myself body painting by mistake, really, because I studied makeup artistry, special effects makeup. And then I realised there was a whole world of body paint and body art, uh, and it opened up a whole new kind of world for me in terms of that. So it just started spiralling from that. And because I think I had all the music in, in influences and music was sort of my passion, my style ended up appe appealing to musicians. I first started getting work, which got me a route into the, the industry and the music industry, and that was via Glamour. In terms of if I'm doing a mixtape body art piece, I have to work out how I'm going to transfer that to a human. Quite often people, I did a full chrome gold body body piece for Snap Capone, who's a, a Radio 1 Extra artist. I've always got to add a touch of my kind of style in there if I can. But if I'm ever given free reign, 
I'll be looking at all of their work, I'll be looking at their imagery, I'll be listening to their music and I'll be sending them ideas about what would look good on that person and quite often I get a model sent through so I can kind of interpret what they're going to look good wearing as well. 80% of the people I work on haven't had it done before and there's always a process of how we're going to go through it. They have kind of a bit of anxiety about standing there naked. I usually say to them, um, when you've got it done, it's going to feel like closing. Sometimes I can be there five hours. So you build up a relationship with that person. And once we've established that, they're kind of easy with what I do. If I have to paint in kind of uh, private areas and things like that, we just go through the motions and I tell them what I'm going to do in advance. The reason that it's mainly female people is because I work for model agencies and then the kind of music videos that I'm doing, the artists are wanting women. Now I do work on men and I do have male models, they're not quite as frequent, but yeah, I do work on males. Uh, it just depends what brief I get. In the beginning, word of mouth, then everything moved online. I was online before, but it was more about networking in the beginning. It's all about social media, it's all about Instagram. Work comes in from Facebook a little bit as well, but work comes in from, from everywhere. So I was a goth when I was 15 and 14, and then I got into punk, and then it all changed when the rave scene started, and my entire music influences and interests just changed totally. When I, when I sort of transitioned from all that and started listening to electronica and, and hip hop, and I just changed and I just evolved, and I got fed up with how things were in the past. It was like a a completely different life. I know from a feeling that is across Sheffield is that there needs to be a lot more collaborations. And that's something where Lloyd came into the picture. He's one of the guys who is uh, fundamental to the Pattern and Push um, project. There are some wicked, wicked talent, you know, some that are only like 14, 15 odd years old. Makes you cry the sort of talent they've got. After a few years around the sun, you'll be proud My name is Rumbi Taro, I'm from Doncaster, and this is the story of my music and me. I can do 
Thanks for listening. Uh, I'm Bert Rogers from Ill Tribe, based in Sheffield, and um, just like to say, music is one race, one colour, and one voice. And this is a story of music and me. Peace. Hi, this is Jonas Dedungs. I'm from Switzerland, a small town called Lax, and this is the story of my music and me. is one race one color one voice this is my story of music and me this is my choice